what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmaid to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. Dominican father, Professor Michael Mesquite. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thanks very much. Thank you all. I'm very delighted to be with you tonight. I've been, uh, as Father Brian's been saying, I've been talking with the brothers the last couple of days, but it's very nice to have some new faces who perhaps may not be as tired of listening to me as these poor brothers have been. So <laughs> they've already been with me all morning, so it's one more time. So thank you all for being here tonight. I'm delighted to be here. As Father Brian has said, I'm going to be talking about one of the fathers of the church, now, for those of us who aren't so familiar who and what these fathers of the church are, these would be these, the early figures in the church's history. If you are part of Latin Christianity, which is us, we are all Latin Christians here, it would be the fathers of the church for about the first 600 years. If we are part of Eastern uh, Christianity, then, ah, all right, we do have someone, wonderful. Then that would take us into the 700s when we would have St. John Damascene, who would be the last of the Greek fathers. So it's this first period of the church's history that is called the patristic period. And I'd like to talk with you about one of the great fathers of the church, an Eastern father, a man named Gregory of Nyssa. When we talk about the early church, often for us it seems like a very distant place with remote and austere individuals who are debating obscure points of theology that seem to have little relevance or even intelligibility for us in the 21st century. Yet, however, this image of the patristic age is, of this obscure, rarefied world, it's wrong. It would be a flawed view of who these people were and what their world was like. For this was a time of remarkable men and women who impressed upon the Christian religion its classic character. So across the centuries, these men and women of the patristic period continue to speak to us and they speak meaningfully to us about who our provident God is, how we are to understand the divine life of the Trinity, who the person of Jesus Christ is, what the mystery of the church is, and the struggles of the Christian life. These, primarily they were men who were grappling with these questions helped the church to come to this self-understanding of itself, of our God, and of how our world has been transformed by Christ. I would say, especially for those of us who are priests, those of us who are religious, those of us who are working in pastoral ministry, and those of us who are committed Christians, this period and these Christians can really be very illuminating and instructive in our own efforts to preach, for those of us who are members of the Order of Preachers, but for those of us who are seeking to live a Christian life, these fathers of the church are, in fact, very helpful and insightful. And by examining their rich contribution to prayer and the Christian life, I would like to focus on, again, St. Gregory of Nyssa. And I'm hoping that we will better appreciate uh, and come to an understanding of the richness of this patristic heritage. Now, many writers of, or I should say several writers of the patristic period, have spoken and written on the Lord's Prayer. 
So in the Eastern Church, the very great theologian Origen wrote on the Lord's Prayer. In the Western Church, we have uh, St. Cyprian of Carthage, St. Augustine, and also St. Gregory of Nyssa, all writing on the Lord's Prayer. Well, who is this Gregory of Nyssa that I've been talking about? Well, as our brothers could all tell you, I could call on any one of them today, they could give you the outline of his life. Gregory lives at the end of the fourth century. He came from a remarkable family. If you can imagine having three people in your family who are all saints, they'd, and that's his family. So his brother Basil the Great was a saint. His sister Macrina is a saint. And he's a saint, so you can imagine what's, what life would have been like in that house if you weren't one of the saints. <laughs> but, <laughs> but three saints. <laughs> and um, he was, um, uh, he began his life wanting to be not a religious, not a priest, but he was, uh, he wanted a secular career. He wanted to study the law. And he got married and uh, after a certain period of time, he felt called to religious life. So we don't know if his wife died or if he uh, asked to leave her, but he went and entered into a monastery. And then his brother, Basil, said, I want you to become Bishop of Nyssa. Well, Nyssa, as I was explaining to the brothers this morning, it was a one-horse town. It was a nothing place, Nyssa. So in one sense, I suppose Gregory could have been insulted that his brother said, I want you to become Bishop of Nyssa. But what Gregory said to him is he said, Gregory, Nyssa will not make you famous, but you will make Nyssa memorable for all time. And in many ways, he has. Nyssa is connected to Gregory and in the Eastern Church especially, he's held in very high regard. He is uh, a very important father in the Eastern Church, but he's an important father for all Christians, East and West. He presents us a vision of prayer that is both striking and I would say very contemporary. And that's why I chose him, because I think he's got something to speak to us in 2020. He was an outstanding philosopher and a speculative thinker. So he was not a practical man like his brother Basil, and he wasn't actually a very good bishop, as I was explaining to the brothers today. He, had, he didn't know how to manage finances. He didn't know how to handle personnel. He wasn't really very, and his brother was often exasperated with him, to tell you the truth. But he was a theologian and a philosopher. And he was able to connect the truths of the faith and explain them in a way that the men and women of his time could understand and grasp them. For us, Gregory speaks, I think, in an important way because he is especially attentive to the demands of justice and an authentic lay spirituality. So for those of us who are not religious, I would like you to kind of keep your eyes and ears tuned to what he might be saying about an authentic lay spirituality and how justice touches our lives. And his reflections on the Lord's Prayer help us to do this. With a knowing eye, he identifies the spiritual needs of a very worldly community. He's a preacher and he knew his congregation. He knew their needs, he knew their concerns, and he knew how to address them. And his approach to prayer is realistic, practical, and it's grounded in human experience. Moreover, it's surprisingly holistic. When I say that his spirituality was holistic, he takes into account the needs of our bodies, he takes into account the needs of our emotions, he takes into account the needs of our intellect and our spirit. It's all part of being a human being, and he's addressing the whole person when he's talking about the spiritual life. Here, in some ways, he doesn't feel that we can separate the petitions we make to God from the 
ordinary needs that we have in our own life. So when we pray, yes, we are addressing God, but we're also talking about ourselves, our needs, and the things that touch us in our own lives. For Gregory, prayer touches our life, our behavior, and our conduct. And our moral life, in turn, influences our prayer. It's all of the same package for him. So Gregory presents a view of prayer that avoids some of the intense introspection that we sometimes think of when we're talking about prayer. Sometimes when we think of prayer, we think of it as something that is intensely spiritual, mystical, and that's not Gregory's understanding at all. In some ways, that vision of prayer we would often associate with the French school of the period after the Reformation, of this very exalted, privatized prayer. Gregory's prayer is not private prayer. It's a public prayer. It's a prayer that's directed outward to the Christian community. It's a, it's a prayer that's directed and grounds us in a community of faith in which we address God. In addressing God, we become more aware of our brothers and sisters. So it's public, visible, and dynamic. Above all, he recognizes that prayer provides Christians with a way to participate in the life of Jesus. Since in our prayer, that we, we find that we are able to truly imitate our Lord. A fine example of this profound relationship between prayer and the Christian life is his own reflection on the Lord's Prayer. It's a very useful way for us for, uh, to come to a deeper grasp of this, the richness and storehouse of patristic spirituality. So let's then begin. And Gregory, again, as a good pastor, as a good bishop, as a smart man, the first question he asks himself is, well, why do we not pray? Why don't we pray? And it's a fair question. He's familiar with the hardworking members of his community and their worldly preoccupations. And so he writes the following. The tradesman rises early to attend to his shop, anxious to display his wares sooner than his, com than his competitors, so as to get in before them, to be the first to attend to the customer and sell his stock. He knows what commercial life is like. And he also knows about customers. He goes on to say, and the customer does the same. He takes good care not to miss what he wants by letting someone else anticipate him. And so he hastens not to church, but to the market. He wants to make sure he gets the goods before anybody else does. All are equally keen on gain and anxious to be on the spot before their neighbors. And the hour for prayer is usurped by those things that hold their interest and is turned into time for business. Business comes first. It's the same with the craftsman, with the orator, with the man who brings a lawsuit, as well as with the judge. Everyone devotes all his energy to the work he has in hand, forgetting completely the work of prayer, because he thinks that the time he gives to God is lost to the work that he has purposed to do. So he understands the busy lives of so many people, and he understands the concerns of the men and women in his congregation. He well recognizes that his community is not so much finding that how to pray is the problem, that's not the problem, but the recognition of the need to pray at all. That's the first question that he feels needs to be addressed. Why do we need to pray at all? Apparently, self-sufficiency was as much a problem in 4th century Asia Minor. When I say Asia Minor, I mean today modern-day Turkey, as in the contemporary world. Many Christians then and now do not experience an ongoing need to pray. Or we find it a low priority. We find, well, okay, I'll spend a few minutes in prayer 
once I get everything else done, or once I find that I'm actually free from these other things I've got to do. But in some ways, for many of us, our lives are busy, and prayer, often, we allow it to take a back seat. Gregory is aware of this. Gregory points out that people have time for their work, energy for their secular activities, and interest in those tasks that they find profitable. And prayer is not usually associated in the minds of all Christians with time well spent. But so prayer is not an immediate concern. Prayer is somehow lost time. Minutes or hours that we could better spend on getting an edge over our competitors, as he says. Since we don't perceive prayer as productive, we pour our energy into those activities that, in fact, do seem useful. So it may mean preparing for class tomorrow and making sure that we get our reading done. We may find that it means making sure that we have time to get to the gym. That becomes very important. Or maybe it's answering those emails that seem to get longer and longer every day. Or finishing the job for work that we have been trying to, uh, that we made a promise to do. Or it could be something as mundane as just making sure we get the wash done. These things become the urgent things. Prayer does not. So unfortunately, Gregory points out, however, that without God's help, we would be able to do none of these things, none of them. We would not be able to do anything at all without God's help. Okay. So why we don't pray? Well, why is prayer then important in light of the fact that we seem to be able to put it on the back burner and find other things that are more important? Why should we pray? Well, with directness and honesty, Gregory faces the issue of peop why people don't pray. But then he goes on to say why prayer is so important in the life of a Christian. First, he says, there's the practical matter of sin. We don't necessarily always identify prayer and sin in the same sentence. But he said, there's a connection here between prayer and sin. If Christians do not pray, they cannot hope to escape from it. If we don't pray, we will find ourselves caught in the web of sin. So he writes this. He says, if work is preceded by prayer, sin will find no entrance into the soul. For when the consciousness of God is firmly established in the heart, the devices of the devil remain sterile. And matters of dispute will always be settled according to justice. If, on the other hand, a man leaves God out and gives his attention to nothing but his business, then he is inevitably opposed to God because he is separated from him. For a person who does not unite himself to God through prayer is one who is separated from God himself. So as Gregory is suggesting here, we are most apt to become unmoored and disoriented when prayer ceases to be a priority in our life. When we pray regularly and consciously acknowledge our own relationship with the Lord, we become less vulnerable to temptation. And we are able to resist sin more easily. Prayer strengthens our resolve to do what is right because we perceive ourselves neither as isolated from God nor as detached from one another. So when our prayer is strong and when our relationship with the Lord is ongoing, we will in fact be able to find ourselves on solid ground. When we have this relationship with Christ, we're on solid ground and we'll find that we will not only be able to hear what our Lord is asking from us, we'll find that we'll be able to do it. Without that, we become a bit like leaves blowing in the wind. We go from one thing to another, and we're not clear. We're not grounded. We're not rooted. 
Our prayer grounds us in Christ and grounds us with one another. Secondly, Gregory says the prayer offers positive benefits for those who practice it. So I've talked about kind of the negative, that it prevents us from sin, keeps temptation out. But he said, you know, let's put this in a positive context. It does good things for us. According to Gregory, prayer is intimacy with God and contemplation of the invisible. It satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and makes us equal to the angels. Now, most of us don't think of prayer as making us equal to the angels, but Gregory insists on this. He says, when we pray, we become like the angels themselves. He asserts that something about prayer is enjoyable. It's something that is uh, it's delightful, just as a friendship should be. Again, when we spend time with a friend, most of us don't find it to be dutiful. It's something that we find enjoyable, relaxing, delightful. He says, that's what your prayer should be like. When you are in prayer with our Lord, this should be an opportunity of being friend to friend in something that is enjoyable, life-giving, and renewing. It should refresh you. In some ways here, St. Thomas Aquinas, we're 400, 800 years later is going to be saying much the same thing when he talks about prayer. For St. Thomas, he speaks of charity as a pleasurable friendship between human beings and God. And Gregory is using this same language. When we pray, we are talking the language of friendship. And when one friend is with, win, with another friend, this is not something that should wear us out, but something that should energize us. It should be a benefit. So uh, sometimes, again, in, when we think about prayer, and it also par it comes partially from our tradition of prayer, we'll talk about this language of when you're praying, it's arid and dry, and you're in the desert. Well, this is not what Gregory is talking about. He's talking about something that, in fact, refreshes and renews. And this would be his invitation to us as men and women who pray to approach our Lord in that way as seeking to spend time with a friend, first and foremost. So just as time spent with a friend refreshes and renews, so a moment set aside for God not only animates, but also transforms the life of a Christian. So prayer, in some ways, keeps us from, um, from uh, sin. It should be a moment of enjoyment, but it also should be something that transforms and changes us. As Gregory points out, because of prayer, a whale becomes a home for Jonah. Because of prayer, the fires that engulf the three young men in the book of Daniel become a moist wind. Because of prayer, people with negative attitudes have been able to take on life-giving ones. And again, if you think about this, when we have prayed, have we, have we found our own lives transformed? When we pursue the practice of prayer, I would say, brothers and sisters, it changes us. If prayer becomes a regular part of our lives, we change because of that. Again, I can speak for myself, but I imagine I can speak for many of you as well. In those moments of, in our lives when we have had thoughts that have paralyzed us, when we've had doubts that have been real, when we have been greatly afraid, when we bring those fears, those doubts, that paralysis to the Lord, what happens? What happens in those instances? We find after we've spent some time in prayer, we are able to get up and go again. Our time in prayer changes us. It transforms us. That's what he's saying here. When we turn to God, when we are desolate, or fatigued or anxious, we rise from our prayer with confidence and courage and even a sense of joy. Prayer transforms. Finally, 
Garvey argues that prayer is beneficial because it's the only way that people can ever begin to really thank God. We cannot really thank God apart from our prayer. And he says this, Now I think that even if we spend our whole life in constant communion with God in prayer and thanksgiving, we should be as far from having made him an adequate return as if we had ever begun to desire making the giver of all good things such a return. So we could spend our whole life praying. And Gregory would say, you know what? It's still not going to be enough time for you to thank God for all he has done for you. Our whole life should be a life of offering God thanksgiving for what he has given us, the gifts that have been ours. In language that's really reminiscent of the book of Job, Gregory says this, Who has spread the earth under my feet? Whose wisdom has made water passable? Who has set up the vault of the sky? Who carries the sun before me like a torch? Who causes the springs to come forth from ravines? Who has given the rivers their beds? Who has subjected the animals to my service? Who, when I was but lifeless ashes, gave me both life and a mind? Who fashioned this clay in the image of the divine? And when this divine image had been tarnished by sin, did not he restore it to all of its original beauty? Who has done this for me but my Lord and Savior? How much we have to thank our God for. Prayer leads us into a stance of thanksgiving for all that we have received. How we should not pray. Having first considered why Gregory, why Christians don't pray, and then why they should pray, Gregory next addresses how we ought not to pray. So our, our time into prayer into sort of a flight of fancy, thinking all kinds of impossible things. He said, no, that's not good prayer. Don't do that. He says this, childless people do not reflect how a thing could possibly take place according to their fancy, but they imagine for all they are worth wonderful things happening to themselves. They daydream about riches, marriages, and kingdoms, and big cities that are called by their name, and they imagine that they actually are in such a position as their silly ideas suggest. So when we pray to God, when we ask the Lord, we should not be asking the Lord for ridiculous things. It doesn't do us any credit, and it kind of doesn't, it doesn't do God any credit either when we ask for ridiculous things. He admits that God does sometimes give to people honor and riches, but it's less as a sign of God's special love for us when he gives us riches and honors and privileges than an, in, than an inducement for us to pray for what is truly lasting, what is truly life-giving, and what is truly beneficial. He notes that in some ways a mother does this with her children. So she gives her child at the beginning of its life everything that the child needs, and God does the same. But then gradually the child withdraws and comes to recognize what it really needs from its mother and learns a new kind of dependence from his mother that is different from this constant need. So he says, it's the same we see in our children. For a time they cling to their mother's breast. They ask everything from her. And they suck from it as much as nature can hold. But when the baby grows up and becomes capable of speech, he despises the breast and seeks other things, whether it's the pinned-on front locks of the mantle or some such things that delight the eyes of infants. And when he grows older still and his mind develops with his body, he leaves behind all childish desires and asks his parents for those things that belong to the adult life. So why does God sometimes give us things that really are not so valuable or important? 
It's not because God thinks these are so good for us, but because he's aware that we need these things if we are going to turn to him for those things that really are going to be important. The goal here is to ask the Lord for those things in our lives that really are important. So the issue really that, that Gregory is raising here for those of us who pray is, do we babble? When we pray, do we babble? Do our own needs and our own woundedness utterly consume us? Does our past or our present so overwhelm us that we cannot look beyond these to the future, to the promises that God has made to each of us? Or do we have the radical confidence of the Christian who prays with a healthy realism to a merciful and provident God? Are we asking really for the things we need? I'm going to give you just sort of an absurd example here. Do I pray to win the lottery? Is this what I'm praying for? Or when I pray, do I pray to the Lord that he'll help me to find ways to make ends meet in my life? Do I pray that the Lord will help me to have enough that I can support my family, that I can live with dignity, that I can really have the things that will be important for my flourishing and the flourishing of those I love. It's not about winning the lottery. It's about those things that are fundamental and basic and important in a life. We don't babble. We pray for the things we truly need. And then we now ask, well, how should we pray the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer not only makes Christians more aware of their relationship to one another and to God, but it helps them to embrace these relationships more fully. So when we're praying, we in fact are helped, we become aware of our relationships, but we also, in our prayer, it, it helps us to embrace those relationships. It's more than just calling them to mind we come to recognize their importance and to embrace them. And through the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer, Gregory shows us how to do this. He takes seriously the role of the Christian in the world and strives to integrate the spiritual and the, corp and the bodily mentions of, di of di discipleship. How we pray should have an impact, my brothers and sisters, on how we live. How we pray should influence how we live. And how we live should be an expression. It should be a kind of manifestation of how we pray. How we live and how we pray are intimately united. So let's begin with our Father in heaven. From the first, Gregory sees the real consequences, the real ramifications in addressing God as Father. It affects us as human beings actually more than it affects God. When we say our Father, what we're really focusing on especially is us. If God is truly our Father, Gregory argues, then we are truly related to God. If God is our Father, we are related to him. Since God is holy and good and joyful and pure, then we who share kinship with God also are to be the same. If this is who God is, then this is who we are to be as well. And he then makes a startling, really, claim here. He says, you know, if we don't exhibit these divine characteristics, if we are not good and joyful and holy and pure, if these aren't obvious in our homes, if this is not obvious in the workplace, if it's not obvious in our life together as brothers in the community, then perhaps God is not really our Father. 
If we're living that way, maybe God is not really our Father. And he asks, What fellowship has light with darkness? What kinship has death with life? How can there be intimacy between what is pure and what is impure? The child of the merciful and pure is himself merciful and pure. The corrupt is not related to the incorrupt. In a word, good comes from good and just comes from just. It's a very challenging statement he makes about how we are to live. And if indeed God is our Father, then we have to live like daughters and sons of such a father. And the same time, though, he goes on to say, Father should give us confidence to address God with a kind of boldness. And the Greek word that Gregory uses here is paresia, which originally meant the freedom claimed by the citizens of Athens to be able to speak their mind boldly and honestly and frankly in the assembly of the city. So it's a kind of confidence that someone has as a citizen. And Gregory says, this is identified with the freedom and liberty that we enjoy as the sons and daughters of God himself. Christians have a relationship with God. Because God is our Father, we have no reason for any of us to feel anxious or awkward or ashamed to present our needs in prayer. Because God is our Father, everything should be asked for, and everything should be asked with directness and without any reservation to our God. We should feel bold and never ashamed to ask God for the things we need in our life. Because we pray our God, Father in heaven, we are reminded also, Gregory says, of our true home, our true country, and our true citizenship. This kinship with God fundamentally alters our relationship to the world. Now, I haven't said very much about Gregory here to um, our friends who are with us, but Gregory would have been somebody who would have been, uh, was part of the Neoplatonic school. And this Neoplatonic school, this worldview, looked to this world is not our home. This world was a kind of imitation world, a shadowy world. Our goal was something beyond. And that's what he's saying here. We are like, Gregory says, the prodigal son who has drifted away from his father and his true identity to dwell among swine in an alien land. This is not our true home, Gregory would say. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas might say otherwise, but this is Gregory. Although we may feel that the world around us is as good as it gets with its pleasures and joys, at a more profound level, prayer makes us aware that these pale in comparison with the fulfillment we will find only in God. Hallowed be thy name. Because God's name is holy, we are certainly to acknowledge God's holiness on our lips, but we are also to make God's name holy by the kind of lives we live. Again, what we say to God has ramifications and consequences for us. If we say, God is holy, hallowed be your name, then I better live my life in such a way that, in fact, I show that God's name is holy. Our lives need to be prudent, temperate, and free from sin. Gregory says, I think it's necessary to make this before all else the principal part of prayer, that the name of God might not be blasphemed but hallowed and glorified through my life, that I don't blaspheme. Who would be so absurdly unreasonable 
as to not to glorify God if he sees in those who believe in him a pure life firmly established in virtue. If we are, if we are living lives of true virtue, then in fact we are assuring that God's name will be held up as hallowed. Again, if I can make an aside here, in some ways the scandal that the church has been undergoing in the last 20 years, how much that has undermined people's belief not only in the church, but even their belief in a God who is holy. When we have been scandalous, people then wonder, is there such a God who is in fact good? Is there a God who is in fact holy? That's Gregory's point. For Gregory, our prayer draws us into a deeper contemplation of who our God is. We come to uh, a more profound recognition that as Christian husbands and wives, parents, friends, brothers, our lives need to mirror the holiness of God himself. And if our lives are not mirroring God's holiness, then perhaps we have to be hesitant about saying, hallowed be thy name. He goes on to then say, thy kingdom come. To the extent that we pray that God's kingdom will come, we pray that we ourselves may imitate God in his freedom. So not God in his holiness, not God in his purity, but that we may be men and women who imitate God in his freedom. Creaturely self-possession is not the result of a passive or expectant waiting. We imitate God in his freedom when we begin to take on some control over our own lives, when we use our wills to, in fact, engage what Gregory will call apatheia. Now, sometimes when we hear this ap word apatheia, we may be thinking it means apathy. But no, that's not what Gregory means by apatheia. He says the Christian life is about the acquisition of apatheia. According to Gregory, I would be a stranger to corruption and liberated from death. Would that I were freed from the shackles of sin and that death no longer lorded it over me. I would be a stranger to corruption and liberated. But may thy kingdom come to me so that the passions which still rule over me mercilessly may depart, or rather may be altogether annihilated. So what his challenge to the Christian is, who says, may thy kingdom come, is you exercise your freedom. Exercise your freedom in such a way that you learn to not be controlled by your passions not to be controlled by your vices, but to live with integrity. So rather, each of us should be seeking a freedom from the bodily and emotional cravings that can consume us. How much all of us can be at times slaves to our desires, our longing, our fears, our hopes. I want this, I want that, and we don't need this. He says, be free of it. Cling to God. Cling to God, exercise your freedom. The serene and liberating joy of apatheia belongs to those who see God, who in some ways already enjoy a taste of his kingdom. May thy kingdom come. And finally, he goes on to say, may thy will be done. In attaining self-mastery and self-control, the Christian counters the influence of the passions by coming now to exercise the virtues. When there is lust, the Christian seeks continence. When there's the vice of cowardice, the Christian seeks the virtue of courage. When there is the disease of sin, we seek the healing of whom? The divine physician, Christ. Where there's an, an unbridled human will, 
we seek the ordered will of God himself. When we pray that God's will be done, we recognize not only the spiritual wounds and diseases that plague us, because that's part of may thy will be done. We see who we are with all of our failings, but we also see the remedies. And the remedies are acquire the virtues. Acquire the gifts that you need, the behaviors. Seek the grace that you can, in fact, counter these inclinations that he calls vice. We strive to establish, with the help of God's grace, behaviors and habits that will strengthen us in our desire to do God's will more completely. Through prayer, we come to long for healing so sincerely and to desire purification so fervently that we beg to achieve and attain apatheia now, as we will attain it in heaven. So it's not only about heaven, it's here now. How can I live freely now where I am the master of my own house, that I am master of my own soul? May thy kingdom come. May your will for me, Lord, be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Because we strive to reach this freedom from unbridled passion, we pray only for our daily bread. And he says, don't pray for anything more. Pray for your bread. So he says, let yourselves no longer be distracted by desiring vanities. Stop heaping toil upon toil for yourself. The needs of your nature actually are very few. You don't need that much. You owe food to your flesh, and it's a trivial thing and you can easily procure it if you content yourselves with what is necessary. What do you need? Why do you lay yourselves under so much tribute? Why do you burden yourself with this desire to have all these other things? Why do you submit yourself to the yoke of paying so many fines? Why do you submit to the yoke of why do you mine silver and dig gold and search for transparent stones for no other purpose than to save your stomach, that perpetual tax collector that may live daintily through all this? Why serve your belly? Rather than yield to this bondage of our bodies, he recommends, so say to God, Lord, give us bread. Give us bread, not delicacies or riches, not magnificent purple robes or golden ornaments, precious stones or silver dishes. We do not ask him for landed estates or military commands or political leadership. We do not say, give us a prominent position in assemblies or monuments and statues raised to us do not give us silken robes and musicians at meals, nor any other things by which the soul is estranged from the thought of God. No, Lord, give us only our daily bread. And it's a question I think that each of us needs to raise and ask ourselves. What truly is our daily bread? What are our delicacies, our riches, our herds of horses, or our hosts of slaves that we crave? What truly is it that we need? Prayer should lead us to wrestle with these questions. And the spirit of contemplation should help us to acknowledge who we really are as Christians and as human beings. Only then can we determine what our authentic needs are. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. When we ask God to forgive our trespasses, we forgive the trespasses of others. But Gregory points out that we do more than simply ask God for mercy. So when we say, forgive us our trespasses, we're asking the Lord for much more than his mercy. In fact, he says, really, there are several consequences to our asking 
forgive us our trespasses. First, this petition makes us aware of our own godlike status. When we say to God, forgive us our, trans our trespasses, we in some ways are making a claim that we ourselves are godlike. I'll explain. Next, when we say, forgive us our trespasses, it gives us confidence to seek forgiveness boldly because we have been bold in forgiving others. Forgive us our trespasses. I can say that to God boldly because I know that I have, in fact, forgiven others. Moreover, it does call us to offer others the same mercy that we're seeking for ourselves. It's the third consequence. And finally, now this one is very strange, and I'll say a little bit more about it. When we say, Lord, forgive us our trespasses, it helps us to recognize that when we forgive others, we become a model of magnanimity that God himself will imitate. We're saying to God, God, you become like me. Become like me, God. So with regard to the first of these, in our prayer for forgiveness, we come to realize our own likeness to God. Since God alone has the power to forgive sins, we imitate what belongs to God whenever we, offense, whenever we forgive the offenses of others. So it's true, as again we see it in the New Testament, when the Pharisees say, well, to forgive sins belongs to God alone. But when you or me forgive one another, then we are in fact being women and men who ourselves are godlike because we're engaging in the same activities that are proper to God. We're doing what God does. Next, when we forgive the sins of others, we have the confidence to approach God knowing that our own sins are forgiven. Gregory says to the church, why do you go to God crouching with fear like a slave because your conscience pricks you? Why do you shut out holy audacity, which is inherent in the freedom of the soul? Why do you seek to flatter with, with words him who brooks no flattery? Why do you offer language of abject servility to God who regards only deeds? Be yourself your own judge. Give yourself the sentence of acquittal. It's in your power to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Do you want your debts forgiven by God? Then forgive them yourself, and God will ratify it. For your judgment of your neighbor, which is in your power, whatever it may be, will call forth the corresponding sentence upon you. So you don't need to be nervous about asking God forgiveness if you have been a man or woman who has been in the practice of forgiving others then have that confidence to approach. Forgive yourself. Finally, Gregory sees the request for divine forgiveness is one that um, uh, is a kind of reversal of the, our relationship with God. Gregory claims it's that God becomes the imitators of our own acts of mercy. And I'm going to read here. Just as in us the good is accomplished by imitating the divine goodness, so we dare to hope that God will also imitate us, that God will imitate us when we accomplish anything good, so that you too may say to God, God, do the same as I have done. Lord, do the same as I have done. Imitate me, your servant, O Lord, though I am only a poor beggar, and you are the king of the universe. I have forgiven the debts. Do not now you demand that back from me. I have had regard to the one who petitioned me. May you do the same to me. Forgive me, be like me. What I have done, you do. It's quite extraordinary when he says, God, imitate me in my generosity in my mercy, in my magnanimity. Because we forgive others, we offer God then a model or standard of charity and generosity. 
lead us not into temptation. In reflecting on this last petition of the Lord's Prayer, Gregory advises us to look critically at the world around us. Look critically. If we truly seek deliverance from evil, we will carefully avoid the dangers that lie lurking in the world. As he says here, if you're afraid of the sea, don't sail on it. <laughs> if you're afraid of war, stay out of battle. If you're afraid of fire, do not build with wood or with straw. If we want to live lives that are free from evil, we will look at our environment, we will look at our situations, and we'll look at our behavior that place us at spiritual risk. We'll explore, for example, how our participation in unjust aspects of our society, its values, its beliefs, its politics, may undermine the gospel and the demands of Christian discipleship. It'll cause us to look closely at our own personal conduct, how we use the internet, and the sites we visit. Do we place ourselves at risk? Do we place ourselves in temptation? It will lead us to ask whether our relationships with others build us up and edify them, or whether our relationships with others are damaging to them and damaging to us. Do we put ourselves in harm's way? Do we take unreasonable chances? Or are we, in fact, seeking to uh, not be put into temptation? As you see from these homilies in the Lord's Prayer, Gregory believes that prayer touches every facet of human life. Prayer points us to the vine, but it also points us to the human. If we contemplate and come to know who God is, then we come to a much more powerful understanding Although we direct our prayer to God, it may be going this way, in some ways the trajectory comes back on us. It turns back toward us so that we may more deeply struggle with what it means to share in the divine kinship, to be in the divine likeness, to become God's ourself. That's what the aim of prayer is, for you and for me to become God's. As we come to a fuller vision of God's goodness, God's holiness, God's forgiveness, we come to acknowledge and to embrace simplicity and justice and mercy as our own. As God is, my sisters and brothers, so we become. And thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Father mm -hmm. Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we have 15 or 20 minutes for, for questions. First, is an observation that I uh, found really helpful is that uh, you make it sound that the Lord's Prayer is very proactive. Yes. You know, never, you know, that never has come across to me. It's always seemed to be very passive. You, mm -hmm. know? Uh, you know, just waiting to be molded and not really engaging, especially the last part. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't like water. <laughs> right. Something like that. I mean, that was really um, uh, helpful. Um, something that's just a uh, question that came up is how did he live? I mean, here he's giving us this whole wonderful template on how we should live our life. Uh, I mean, he seems to be someone that would be, you know, running to the desert. You know what I mean? Uh, to just to make sure that he's, you know, uh, following this template. You know, I would. You know, bishop. yes, he was a bishop in many ways. Um, he's an interesting man. Again, he was a theologian. He wrote a lot, so he's doing a lot of writing that is on very exalted spiritual topics. But at the same time, he's a bishop, and he's preaching regularly, and he's talking with people. And he's involved in the work of administration. He didn't do it very well. It wasn't a strong suit. But 
he was very much involved in the world. So in some ways, I can only think in a way, he understood, I think, the, the, the different ways that the men and women in his community were being pulled in lots of different directions. And I think for that reason, he saw prayer as something that grounded him. And in grounding him in his own relationship with Christ and with the Trinity, he saw that that had real consequences in terms of how he was supposed to live with others. He was obviously a man who spent many hours in prayer because I think he needed it with all the different kinds of obligations he had. I don't know if I'm, am I answering your question here? Or? Uh, pretty much, can I just, uh, you know, I, I guess, was his life pretty simple? I guess not because... No, I don't think his wife was so simple. I think it was a complicated life. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, yeah. uh, I guess the juxtaposition. I yes. Yeah, no, it's, you might think that he would have been something like a desert father who would have just spent his whole life, but I think not. I think that's, in a way, where I find his, his commentary, his, his uh, sermons on the Lord's Prayer so persuasive, because at least to me, they ring true. They ring true. I'm not somebody who lives uh, in the desert. I, I live in the world. And I, and I also have got some commitments. So I, it, it rings true what he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So on the, the one, Luke's line of temptation, where you're taking the sermon, uh, what about those who are constantly or only criticize others, especially those like in political power? And that's what they do. They just constantly criticize others. And your point here, Lupe? I, I guess more of a question. You know, I would say, again, if I, if I can shift it a bit, we're living in a world, for example, where uh, if, we're, if we're only allowing ourselves to get caught up in some of the, uh, the blogs and, and some of the, the, the destructive political conversations that we see going on, I don't think that they're going to be good for us to... Uh, to participate or even to get engaged in that. For me, I find, at least for myself, lead us not into temptation. I'm best when I step back from that. Because, in fact, what I want for the church and for our society is a unity. I want courtesy. I guess I want some of the kind of conversation that would have happened in the United States 30 or 40 years ago when men and women knew how to work together for the common good. And what I'm seeing in so much of the media is inimical to that. So I don't really want to watch that. And right. I How would you use kind of him to be a suggestion for others to pretty much? <coughs> well, I would, I would say again, when you're, when you're involved in those kind of blogs or if you're drawn to that kind of thing, what is it doing to you? No, I'm, I'm, it's not me. It's others. How to guide them to get away from that. I would say the same things to them. If, if they're drawn to that kind of conversation, what is it doing to them? I, I think it's ultimately destructive. Other thoughts, comments, please? I'm just wondering, um, in the 4th century, in the Western Empire, mm -hmm. the Roman state was still yes. powerful. Yes. But I wondered if how St. Gregory and any other church fathers, uh, particularly at his best, if, if they had to deal with if they had to deal with the pressure from Rome or whether they further. Well, again, uh, this the Roman Empire still was in existence in, in Gregory's time, but for all practical purposes, the empire had divided. So the in the, the center of the empire in the east had become Constantinople. And Constantinople continued, although we call it the Byzantine Empire, they thought of themselves as the Romans until 1453 when uh, Constantinople fell to the Turks. So Gregory is living in Cappadocia. Oh, I thought he was in the western 
No, no, no. He's Nissa is in the is in modern day Turkey. It was in uh, the province called Cappadocia. Mm -hmm. So for him, there was still stability. Now the Western Empire, uh, the city of Rome, will be attacked and fall to the Visigoths in 410 under a man named Alaric. But in uh, while Gregory is still writing, it's the Rome hasn't fallen yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We talked uh, about how in prayer we don't really change God's mind. We just sort of we, we dispose ourselves to more mm -hmm. than we receive God's grace and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. How do we square that with this interpretation of by our forgiveness we sort of we ask God to imitate us. We ask God to almost in a way change Himself to match the way that we forgive. How do we? How do we kind of? Could you? You know, I, I guess what I would say, yes, I, we never change God's mind, but, but in some ways, do you see what he's really doing in this petition? It's less about God in many ways, and it's more about you. <laughs> if you are, in fact, forgiving your neighbor, then in some ways, when you go to the Lord and ask, Lord, forgive, forgive, uh, forgive us our trespasses, you can, in fact, say it with some confidence because he has he's done it, uh, because you have done it. Um, so is, that, is that sort of saying, I'm asking God to imitate me only insofar as I've imitated Yes, me? yes. So, I mean, that's really the incentive here. When, when we're saying, God, imitate me, what's, what's being presumed here is that you have already forgiven others. That's... So there's always the challenge here. It's on us <laughs> to be men and women who forgive. That's the source of our confidence, that we are requesting that. Uh, our confidence comes from the fact that I am a woman, I am a man who has tried to live my life forgiving those who have injured me, forgiving those who have hurt me. And because I've done that, I feel I can ask the Lord with confidence now, forgive me, forgive me. And in that sense, I am acting like God, because God is alone the one who forgives sins. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you speak a little bit more about this philosophy in terms of Peter's not just in patience? And what exactly is he asking for? Is it the discernment? Yes, I think what he's really saying is, okay, well, it's very good for us to say, lead us not into temptation. And we can understand this in a very spiritual way. Well, Lord, you know, just lead me not into temptation. But he's, again, he's putting it much as a good part of the burden on you. Again, it, and it's going on, it's really a question of, again, our will. Are you, are you putting yourself into temptation? If you're putting yourself into temptation, then it's ridiculous for you to ask God not to lead you into temptation. So if you are, by the way you're living, are you, uh, are you, you know, are you playing with fire? If you're playing with fire, then plan on being burned. It's not enough to say, lead me not into temptation. I think that's really the point he's making here. So again, it's realistic. Yes, Gregory. Mm -hmm. in community. So in, in the case of our father, how would it have created back then? Well, is it in the context of um, the Eucharist? Yes, it would have been in the context of the Eucharist, but also the liturgy of the hours. What, uh, again, in the East, they would speak of as the divine liturgy. It's the Eucharist, but also the liturgy of the hours. But my point is that, that prayer is something that's directed to God, but it is also, something that in my praying to our Father in heaven, it recognizes that in that very, those very words, that prayer is making claims on how I'm to live with my sisters and brothers. That's the public piece here. It's not something that's just sort of me and my sweet Jesus here. Me and my sweet Jesus has got real consequences for how I live in the world with the men and women who are around me. So in that sense, 
if we are going to be women and men of prayer, it makes real claims on our living and seeking justice in our world. I didn't read this section because it was, I was concerned about time. When he says, give us this day our daily bread, he says, you be careful that when you ask for your daily bread, you're not asking for things that are going to take away the bread from others. If by your desire for daily bread, you're making other people go hungry, you know, it's unforgivable. Other thoughts, questions? I mean, they don't have to be questions. Any observations? Does what he's saying, does it ring true to you? Does it, uh... please? It seems like it's a powerhouse of wisdom mm -hmm. he has. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Again, I would encourage you to read it. Uh, you can probably find this in most libraries. This is in the series called The Ancient Christian Writers. It's very, it's not hard reading, and it's, uh, it's a good translation. Uh, ancient Christian writers. It comes out of um, the Newman Press, Westminster, Maryland. This one was published in 1954, but you could find it in any university library. Uh, I'm sure uh, our brothers have it at the, uh, the DSPT, and, uh, it's, and it's short. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm-hmm.